Sit. Dennis Sherwood. How, I mean, who would have thought? Here we are. Um, we are on a podcast together, and I met you. I mean, at least I heard about you many moons ago, and I kept on hearing about you from my wife. Um, so always had this wonderful image of you. And then all of a sudden, I went to an event at the beginning of this year uh, for the Business Book Awards. I was just invited. And there, all of a sudden, there was this specialist uh, business book award. And the winner is Dennis Sherwood. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I know that name. So in your own words, Dennis, welcome to the show. Who are Who is Dennis Sherwood? Yeah, well, uh, Minta, it's great to be on the show. It's great to have this conversation. And that really is a, a wonderful anecdote. Um I'm Dennis Sherwood. Uh, my main interest is in creativity, innovation, and indeed systems thinking. Um, and indeed, you know, the book that uh, Minty you just mentioned is uh, specifically about creativity. But my um, heritage uh, has been in the consulting industry, really, uh, you know, ever since I left university. And it was my pleasure to uh, work with Yendi, your wife, when we were both at Bossar Consultants. And that would have been in the kind of latter part of the uh, 1990s. So that's getting on for uh, 25 years ago. Um, and it's great that uh, Yendi uh, remembers me and indeed spoke nicely of me to you and for you to spot that. Um, but, you know, I've been consulting and working with clients of all sorts, all scales, all sectors of uh, industry and commerce and public sector too. Um, and for the last 20 years, has really been all around uh, creativity and uh, innovation and uh, the purpose of which is to make the world a better place. I hope I've contributed a bit to that. <laughs> Well, we are going to talk about that specifically, um, but I also wanted to just nip in and say that we both went to a, uh, we spent some time in New Haven, Connecticut. So you, ha you have many uh, initials and diplomas. Tell us about your, uh, what, what drove you to go to Yale University? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, uh, uh, when I left school, um, my uh, ambition at that time was to be a chemist. Um, or a biochemist, in fact, because I'd read a book when I was about 15. It's called The Science of Life by a guy called Stephen Rose. And, you know, that really was, you know, uh, looking back, it sounds a bit pompous, say a transformational experience. Um, my father actually was a dentist. And you know how these things are, you, are as, as a kid. I was sort of programmed to become a dentist from, you know, the age of two. Um Open but, wide. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, and, you know, it was, it was you know, the world I knew. So that's what I would do. But um, in, uh, in my teens, I was about 15. I read the book called The Science of Life, which was a book about, you know, biochemistry, basically, and how all living things are just, you know, chemical reactions and so on. And that really, really uh, caught my imagination. So my intention was to... Um, become a, a biochemist. Um, but when I went to university, um, I had the benefit of doing quite an interdisciplinary uh, program. Um, so I did you know, maths, I did chemistry, I did physics, I did cell biology. Um, and in the end, decided that perhaps biophysics was a bit more fundamental than biochemistry. So when I got my undergraduate degree, which was in physics, I wanted to do biophysics. And this is 1970. Now, biophysics was not known hardly at all in the UK at that time, and was specialised in two fields. One was all about um, X-ray crystallography of proteins and that sort of stuff, of which the MRC uh, unit in, in Cambridge was and still is you know, a, a wonderful place to be. And the other angle on biophysics was about nerve and muscle where University College London was the place to be. I wanted something a bit broader. So I looked around a bit and found that in the United States, biophysics was um, a much broader spectrum. And so um, I applied to Yale University to join the um, Department of Molecular Biochemistry and Biophysics, which says it all. So I found myself um, you know, on the, uh, on the boat to uh, North America and arrived at Yale in the September of 1970. Now that was very, very alarming because J. 
just a few weeks before there'd been the Kent State murders where the National Guard had shot students in a in you know dead in um, a demonstration at Kent State University in Ohio and there have been real big riots in New Haven uh, where Yale is um, between you know the uh, black community there and the police and when I arrived at Yale in September of 1970 there were photographs all over the campus of what had happened literally a few weeks beforehand so I was expecting quite a bit of trouble but actually um, I was there 70 through to 72, um, everything quietened down there and had a wonderful time um, at Yale, in fact, and that, that was really, really good. What an arrival. I can't imagine uh, your parents were thrilled at that idea, <laughs> at that moment, so kind of how the media was playing it out. And, and obviously you don't have the same kind of access to information, no internet, yeah. just to click on you know YouTube and see the videos. Yeah, or indeed sending emails or text messages home. <laughs> whatever um it was a um a, a hairy time um uh various good things happened in uh, new haven like i met the lady who is now and still is my wife we got married in 1972 but it turned out that the um chap who was my phd supervisor at yale got a tenured position at the university of california at san diego um in the fall of 1972 so he invited me to go to san diego uh with him to finish my phd so annie and i decamped from the east coast to the west coast and spent two years in uh, la jolla california a lovely place to be indeed and, um you know i got my phd there then did some work in mexico but then we came back to Britain, and in the summer of 1974, we drove from the um, West Coast to the East Coast. And as we were driving along, we were listening to the Watergate event, huh. because the Watergate event was happening in real time at that time. We arrive on the East Coast. We're getting the boat home from New York. The evening that we are leaving... The boat was sailing at about midnight. We didn't have to be on till about 10 o'clock. We went to a Broadway show. And the Broadway show was Peter Cook and Dudley Moore's live show in New York. Um, my wife still doesn't understand it, but there you go. Um, we went there and really enjoyed it. But the halfway point in the show, where there would have normally been the interval, they brought a television onto the stage, which was Nixon's resignation speech. So the last thing that happened in our four years in America was we run up the gangplank to the boat holding newspapers with the headline Nixon quits. So we were in the States from Kent State to Nixon. What a four years to be in America. Wow. Yeah. Uh, f funnily enough, Dennis, uh, this recording will go out. Uh, in a couple of weeks, but uh, in, in Yendi in my life, we just watched again all the president's men. I yeah. mean, really, two nights ago. So talk about talk about a transformation time. You also were in the United States, therefore, for the end of uh, Vietnam, and yeah. and presumably that was quite hairy and very active on campus at Yale as well. Well, you know, um, at Yale, um, Yale, like also in Cambridge, has colleges. I was a member of Saybrook College, nice place. Saybrook. To be. I was in Silliman. You were in Solomon, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember it well. Um, and you remember, you know, the dining hall and all that, as, as one has. Now, I remember when we went into the dining hall, um, we'd sit down, you know, large groups, very lively atmosphere. But there would be a community of people who were looking very worried. And they would have been about to graduate and waiting for their draft number. And wondering, either they get into med school and that gets parked or they get the wrong number so they were really really concerned because on the other side of the dining hall or the other side of the table there were some people who were very very quiet they didn't say much at all and they were the vets that had returned from vietnam and had come back to college and i remember that vividly i remember that vividly as an outsider it didn't affect me directly um, but it was a heavy, <coughs> excuse me, a heavy atmosphere at that time. Absolutely. Well, we we um, 
certainly I think are far away in our pleasurable life of convenience these days from that type of, a, of an issue. And thankfully so. So this is kind of a nice entree to the beginning of uh, this book, Creativity for Scientists and Engineers, for those who are on video, a practical guide. Um, and at the very beginning, you write that this book is for those who wish to make the world a better place. So I'm wondering to what extent, well, why did, why did you write that? And how, how do you determine what is the right better place? Yeah, uh, the, uh, that, that's uh, a lovely thing to talk about. Um, I've been interested in, in creativity for a long time, and we'll talk, I'm sure, about what creativity actually means. Mm. Um, but fundamentally, the result of creativity is implementing something. And the intention of that, to me, is it must make something better than it is now. There is no point in implementing something which takes you backwards. So all creativity should end up with some kind of event happening, the purpose of which, or the consequences of which, are to make the world better. Now, as soon as we say, what does better look like, we get into deep water. And that deep water is all around what I think is a very, very um, naughty bit of the English language, your French. I suspect it works in French as well, you can tell me. But if you say something like, hey, that's a really good idea, yeah? We say that all the time, we hear it, uh, we think it, and of course, the opposite, you know, that's really not very good, is it? Now, let's compare that is a good idea, you know, linguistically to that is a red car. Now, if you go to the car and look at the colour, you and I will agree it is red. If you are a scientist, you will do, you know, spectroscopic measurements of the reflected light, and that will correspond to a wavelength, which we will say define as red. So redness is a property of the car. That is a red car attributes the adjective red as a property of the car. Now, here's the linguistic sleight of mind. That is a good idea, sounds as if it's doing the same thing, attributing goodness to the idea. Now, I put it to you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that there is no such thing as a good idea, an idea which is intrinsically good in the same sense as the car is intrinsically red. Because goodness or badness of an idea says more about me than it does about the idea. What I'm really saying when I say that's a good idea is I like the idea or I like the person that is advocating the idea or it is politically expedient for me to be seen to be agreeing with that person. Virtue signaling. All means all of those things. And it's not a statement of the idea itself. So when ideas are put on the table and one is saying, is this actually an idea which will make the world a better place or not? That is a process that I call evaluation or wise evaluation, distinguishing it from creativity, having the idea in the first place. And wise evaluation is a very, very slippery and difficult thing to do with wisdom. I would say that the wisdom is about making the world a better place, but better is a subjective judgment or a value judgment of the person doing the, the judging. And you know, the world is full of examples. You know, is Brexit a good idea? Well, you know, people have been arguing about that since 2016 and before, and, and there is no answer to that. It depends on who you are. So my intent in saying I want to make the world a better place is actually putting my values on what better looks like. But whatever happens, you've got to have the idea first. You can't even attempt to make the world a better place unless you have an idea. And of course, creativity is that process by which those ideas emerge and get developed. There's a whole lot to unpack in that one, Dennis. Um... First of all, I think that uh, just with regard to evaluation, let's say, of Brexit, we could still be evaluating it in 30 years' time, I think. 
So that's that's sort of my yeah. opinion. Yeah. Second of all, so when you talk about, let's say, making a good idea, it seems like you should be saying what is good about that idea in order to at least make it more explicit. So otherwise, the idea, which we don't even know what the idea is, it's a good, that's a good idea. What do you mean by an idea, first of all? And okay. what makes it good? Yeah. Um, an idea, to my mind, is some kind of representation of something that doesn't exist in front of us right now. It's, abstract. it's, a, it's an act of imagination to start with, and it happens inside your head or my head. It doesn't happen in the space between us. Everything starts in a single human brain, to my view, where my imagination is envisaging or representing in some way something that doesn't exist now. Now, that representation might be in all sorts of different ways. And when that representation is captured in some way, that might be in terms of a picture, it might be a piece of music, it might be a conversation, but it starts in the head. Now, creativity is all about how you might actually achieve that and the various processes to do that. I would then put that idea on the table and then you can observe that idea and you can have a dialogue with me and as a result of that, the idea will get enriched until some point arises where we might be thinking about, can we do something with this idea? So creativity is all of that stuff, getting an idea to a point at which it makes sense to start saying, well, do we just leave that idea alone or do we do something with it? So you migrate from the creativity process to evaluation. And there's all sorts of things. A lot of it is in the book of the actual process of idea generation and enriching that imagination. When we come to the evaluation stage, um, and there's a lot in the book about the process for wise evaluation, but the starting point is a description. It is absolutely fundamentally important that the idea is described as richly as possible so that you can understand it, other people can understand it, and I can understand it. And we can say, ah, we're all looking at the same thing. And of course, that was one of the great Brexit failures in that it would actually describe what it would look like. You have to have that description first, which can be quite challenging to do. And then you can then say, well, actually, how can I imagine what might happen if that idea were implemented? And what would the differences be in the world once that implementation has happened as compared to today? So you're doing that comparison. And then you look at those consequences and you say things like, in what senses are those consequences better than today and better to whom? And the to whom bit is really, really important. You then say, um, are any of those consequences, in fact, disadvantageous as compared to today? And to whom? And you actually think about that really, really hard. So there's processes for wise evaluation. There's processes for creativity, the imagination bit. Um, that's you know what the book is all about. And as a generality, to my mind, wise evaluation is harder to do well than having the idea in the first place. Mm -hmm. I can imagine that. I want to get back to one thing you'd said, Dennis, about the, the idea of creativity having to be uh, for progress or something better, as I understood what you said. Because I'm, I'm thinking of art and or punk music, for example. I think of Dada or other movements that don't seem, at least at first brush, to be wanting to make it a better place. It's more a statement of the emptiness or the statement of nothingness or, or nihilism, which sounds like it's maybe, if you, even if you're being creative in that end, it doesn't sound like it's for better. Okay, um, that's a lovely point. Let me start back with what the manifestation of creativity is. Now, when creativity becomes real, there's only one true statement that you can say. If here is the world as it was before the idea was there, 
made real, that is. And here is the state of the world after the idea has been made real. So, you know, a piece of surrealist art is now on the wall. Magritte has done it or whoever, and it wasn't there before. The only thing that you can say is something different has happened. So to me, creativity is about difference. It's not necessarily about novelty. It might be new. It's just different. Now, you then say, is that difference worth implementing? Is it worth the trouble for Magritte to do that painting or Picasso to do that painting or Duchamp to you know, put his urinal up in the, in the museum? Now, that requires some degree of permission. It requires permission in my own head, actually, to allow myself to do it. And it requires in an artistic sense, permission of whoever is going to hang it if it's in a public place. Now, they will collectively agree that the world is better by virtue of that having happened, where better might not be um, so much in the sense of um, better welfare or whatever it might be. It might be, and particularly in the case of, say, surrealists, but in the sense of I've actually shocked people into a heightened sense of awareness about a particular concept or issue. And having actually achieved that jolt, although that jolt to the observer might be um, a bit startling or uncomfortable, that jolt having taken place, you know, to Duchamp's point of view or Stravinsky, if it's the right of spring, he will say, I've made the world a better place because I've shaken something up. And it comes back to, uh, you know, what does better look like um you know monet was ridiculed for his uh, first impressionist painting and everyone laughed at him and you know he, he had to suffer that um from his personal point of view he felt that he had made the world a better place because of the transformation he had done to art and he was just as many other artists are ahead of their time so that comes back to the very subjective view of better um and you know it's multi-dimensional uh nature and the fact that it is very unlikely that any idea when implemented will please every human being on the planet there will well, always be some people who are disadvantaged by it so as a businessman um i would tend to say that's to be desired because the idea of having an idea that pleases everybody everywhere all the time feels like no idea is will never ever fit that. And so I'd rather have something that seems a little bit provocative, which brings up in, in the way you describe things, the, the space for destructive creativity. Uh, yeah. And, um, you know, as you were talking there, Minta, the, the word risk goes through my mind because making something different takes individuals, communities of all scales to a different place. Um, and that different place um, is associated with risk. And of course, the world is full of examples of ideas which have been implemented, where the world has become a manifestly worse place as a result of that, um, in my view. Um, let's take something really um, quite, you know, uh, historically very relevant. Um, here we are in 1805, we're having a conversation about should we abolish the slave trade in the UK and the colonies? Um, it's in Parliament. Uh, you've got a group of people who are saying it is a good idea to abolish the slave trade because it is inhuman. And you've got the plantation owners and the slave traders who are making money from it. And so they think that the slave trade is a very good idea and look how rich I am. And that debate happened over 20 -ish years in the UK Parliament until 1807 when they changed the law. Now, I think that the world is a better place for that having happened. But the plantation owners and the slave traders who own the ships, you know, to an extent might have been impoverished. Some of them would have been. And they certainly thought it was a, a bad thing to do. One of my favourite things to do, actually, and I'd love to write a book on it, is actually to go back in history and look at the parliamentary debates about things like um, votes for women. Um, that was an idea that was around for decades. It took the First World War to make that happen. 
And of course, all those pompous men in Parliament said that's a very bad idea indeed, and they would have made speeches as to why. And yet, I believe that the enfranchisement of women in the UK and around the world was one of the most constructive and better things that could ever have happened. So the issue of what is a good idea and what is a bad idea and who do you please and who do you not please is complex and is all about actually, at the end of the day, the authority of the person who has the opportunity to make that idea happen or indeed to kill it. I think in a business context, most of the kind of decisions that are about ideas are of a much more um, limited uh, scope, you know, introducing new products or maybe going into a new market. Yeah, that's all about evaluating ideas. But of course, the impact of ideas those ideas is very, very different from the impact of abolishing slavery or right votes for women or, or Brexit. But it, it, it's a very interesting issue. It certainly is. And uh, I mean, obviously, most business decisions are rather prosaic. But I did want to I'll see if we can skip yeah. into that idea a little later. But yeah. when we were talking about the wise evaluations uh, and the description of the idea, it does feel like there, and certainly in business anyway, a place for storytelling at that point. Because the idea of being having a thorough, complete description would also mean, well, I'm going to tell you about the risks and, and that why it might not work and, and maybe other, other elements that will kibosh creativity. Um, yeah, I, I, I love the concept you have there of storytelling. Um, if you think about... Um, uh, one thing about evaluating an idea is it has to be done in the abstract because it doesn't exist yet. You don't actually know. So was the Model T Ford a good idea or not? At the time it was proposed, you know, no one knew. So there's risk there. So how do we imagine what the world would look like if the Model T were there or if Kit Kat Chunky were there or whatever it was? Now, um, in certain circumstances, you do prototyping and you build models. You know, architects do that with their ideas for buildings. So you can look at it. And nowadays with, you know, all the computer graphics, you can really see how the building will be used, for example. Um, but if you've got a community of people who collectively take a decision, do we invest in this idea? Yes or no. The power of story in helping people envisage what the world will look like if this product has been launched or if we go into that particular market or if we expand our service range into these so that people can really um, imagine themselves in it they are then in a much better position to judge you know is this in my own terms good or bad and to have a conversation about it so storytelling of what the world would look like um, is integral. And of course, um, that dovetails very much into scenario planning. Scenario planning is all about stories of what the future might look like. And I think that scenario planning embodies much creativity in designing those stories, which senior management teams can then imagine and and say, should we have a strategy that tracks in this direction or that direction? The power of story is wonderful. There are so many things in the book, Dennis, so we're obviously not going to get to touch it all. That's why people have to run off and get the book, Creativity for Scientists and Engineers. Uh, but in the wise valuation process that you write about, you also write about transparency as being one of the criteria. And the thought that ran across my head at that point was when I worked with Samsung, and as you know, Yendi, my wife, worked for Apple, and, and many of the tech companies have a very strong, I would say, oath of secrecy and protection of IP. How does transparency, creativity, and secrecy work together? Yeah, um, I think uh, within an organization, um, colleagues my belief is that transparency and openness is fundamental so you know if apple are thinking about or thought about at the time you know what might an ipod looks like or the iphone 
Um, I think it is absolutely essential that they had to be very open and transparent with each other. The reason being is that whoever it was that you know first conceived what an iPad or an iPod or an iPhone might look like, uh, you know, Jonathan Isaac, whoever it might have been, um, won't have got it all right. So if I hold it to me until I suddenly release it on the world, it won't be as rich and as good as if I'm talking about it with you. So transparency and openness amongst the team. Now, given that any one commercial organisation is in competition with another, I can then understand why there might be barriers around that. But those barriers are about barriers of what you leak out. I also think that it's very important that if I'm within Apple or Samsung or whatever, I am as observant as I can be of what I'm allowed to notice beyond my own boundaries and as imaginative there. So that's allowing information in. So transparency within is absolutely essential. One of the biggest barriers to creativity and innovation is the individual who hogs stuff and won't share. And that's, to my mind, you know, very, very counterproductive. So um, there are organisational bounds, intellectual property, and, you know, not wanting the competition to catch up with you. That I can understand. Um, but within an organisation, I've come across so many times that people don't share information with one another. That, to my mind, is pretty lethal. Indeed. Well, the, I mean, certainly I, I'm familiar for having worked within big business about how people uh, will give primacy to their own careers rather than actually the company's results. And yet it seems like in those tech companies, there is this need to have uh, almost structural secrecy, structural op opacity, because they the the challenge they don't want anybody to know what the overall piece is going to be. So an individual is made to work on a specific thing, doesn't know all the people working on it, and and that's how they try to keep it under wraps. Because as you say, people are looking in, and in in a world where today everything is available and open, that transparency can be a double edged sword. Yeah, it can be, um, uh, but I think actually that. Um, you know, need to know compartmentalization within organizations um, actually is, is, is fundamentally counterproductive. Um, I've done, you know, some work in, in the defense industry and, um, you know, need to know is very understandable, but actually it limits the capability of, um, you know, two minds being better than one, you know, at scale. Um, now, there's a trade-off there. If the boss thinks that actually the loss attributable to the absence of that connectivity is bearable compared to the benefit that one might get, that's the boss's decision. Um, but my immediate stance is that, you know, holes are greater than some of the parts and you manage it properly. Um, and that's a good thing to do. You write a lot about how curiosity is an important part of creativity. It, it feels for me that uh, maybe intellectually, we all have a lot of creativity, a curiosity. And maybe at some level, the risk is getting curiosity on everything, especially if you're a generalist. And you can end up going down gazillions of rabbit holes. And that need to know element that you just talked about feels like a way to contain my curiosity because otherwise I could just spend my entire time absorbing, reading about new things. Oh, that's really interesting. Oh, I love that click here. Next thing you know, you're going down another rabbit hole and you want to move from biophysics to uh, comics in Japan. Yeah, um, I, I think that's real. And I think there are some people who, uh, you know, th their life is like that. Um, and, you know, they will trip over and spot and do creative things in all sorts of different ways from an organizational perspective that's maybe not very very efficient and to my mind um you know some degree of you know self-awareness um that you know there's a time when actually not incrementally fussing with it is actually less valuable both to yourself and the organization actually getting on and doing it um those are 
uh, both personal judgments and organizational judgments. But I think the wise organization actually understands when there's a real benefit and the need for being you know, really, really expansive and creative, and when there's a time for getting on with it. Um, so, you know, as you know, in the book, I talk about the, the four stages, creativity to start with, wise evaluation, um, development, which is making the idea work, and then implementation. Now, I think that different personality styles feel more comfortable in, you know, uh, maybe only just one of those four stages. And organizations can get into real trouble when the creative person just says, hey, 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 I've had this great idea, you know, the week before the project gets launched or something. That's disruptive. So understanding the um, personality preferences of individuals and where they fit along that four-stage process, I think is one of the things organizations, um, you know, need to understand and to manage and of course if individuals don't like that then they will leave and you know set up their own business or their own chaos as as, as might happen in indeed amongst those attitudes or differences I, I imagine heavily the tolerance for risk Dennis I want to um there are so many others so I'm going to try to get into a couple more one is so we're all talking about creativity specifically for scientists and engineers and I was just wondering what does is creativity different when you're a scientist or engineer than than in other fields and professions? Um, my answer to that is is, is no. Um, creativity is the same for absolutely everything, um, because you know creativity is is having an idea, and the way in which you have ideas, you're searching for difference rather than novelty. And, you know, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is different from his Third Symphony, um, but it's the, the same thing. Um, the reason that I wrote the book for Scientist Engineers was more about mindset and process rather than fundamental difference. There are any number of books on creativity that you will see in the bookshops or at the airport. They're either targeted at, you know, managers, or kind of self-help books. Um, there are very, very, very few books which are written in a language that is amenable and familiar to people with a scientific and engineering background, uh, or that contains examples about that, or that describes a process which is disciplined and quite rigorous in the way that scientists and engineers quite like and there's a lot of scientists and engineers who actually work in businesses or in public service um computer scientists medics you know that they all have a rather more uh, disciplined knowledge heritage so they like disciplined processes so i've phrased the book in that language but i've written other books which are more general because you know people in the arts and humanities or any field, the fundamentals of creativity and wise evaluation are identical. But the way you might express it or depict it or illustrate it, I think can chime into uh, the disciplines and the mindsets that different individuals have. Well, it was certainly good for me. I, I'm no scientist, no engineer, and it was useful for me to sort of plug into that mindset one of the things that really struck me, Dennis, was um, how often you referred to this chap called Arthur Kessler, because I, I, I saw the name first. Oh, that's the name of an author, a novelist I used to read. And and uh, you're talking about him in creativity and this, the sleepwalkers. And I was like, oh, what is all this? How, how does he know? What, do, what does he know about creativity? And then, of course, I recognized that why well, I had to sort of plug back and see that he also had written all these other books. So you woke in my mind. He he wrote a book for me that was very uh, powerful called Darkness at Noon. He also wrote Dialogue with Death, which was fascinating. So that was kind of a fun thing. So two other areas I want to get into, which is um, the notion of spotting patterns. I, I My personal mission I've always written is uh, to elegantly elevate the debate and connect dots, people and ideas. And, and in the connecting dots, I, I'm materially thinking about connecting patterns. And it was a, an interesting pa 
uh, chapter when you talk about spotting patterns and what makes a pattern better than others. And, and I thought of apophenia, which is something which is seeing meaningfulness where none exists. How do you determine a better pattern? Yeah, uh, let's uh, unpack quite a lot of the stuff there. And it does actually come back to um, Arthur Kessler. Um, yeah, Arthur Kessler uh, is or was, uh, you know, a, a, a true polymath. Um, he was born in 1905 in um, Budapest um, under the Austro-Hungarian Empire, amazingly enough. Um, he was at university in Vienna, where he trained as uh, an engineer. Um, but I don't think he completed his program. Um, and when he left, he became a journalist and did a lot of writing and in 1936, I guess it was, he was a journalist covering the Spanish Civil War. Um, he got arrested by the Republican side, Franco's side, and was sentenced to death. Um, but there was some deal with the British Secret Service where there was a prisoner exchange. He escaped from that. Um, that was the basis of Darkness at Noon, which isn't set in the Spanish Civil War, but as you know, in Stalinist Russia on death row a totally gripping psychological story. Um, during the Second World War, he won the Croix de Guerre in France um, and wrote books on all sorts of subjects. But he was originally an engineer and he was fundamentally interested in creativity and wrote four books on it. And in one of the books, he says that creativity is not the act of an Old Testament God, let there be light, the Eureka moment. It is not that despite the myth that it is but it's a it's a matter of selecting and reshuffling already existing components into new patterns and the more familiar the new pattern the more you say aha and when i first read that it's in his 1964 book the act of creation i was really amazed i was very very surprised because up to that point i had thought Creativity was about discovering something new, and basically it was the eureka moment. Suddenly I'm walking along, flash of lightning, boom. Because that's the myth, that's the storybook, that's, you know, Archimedes jumping out of the bath and Newton's apple and all of that. Um, Kessler said, no, it isn't that at all. It may appear like that at the end, and it's obviously portrayed at that, but it's about finding new patterns of already existing components. Now, that actually made my brain explode because it said fundamentally in creativity, there's nothing new because there are existing components. And of course, the best example of that is music. Beethoven didn't invent the notes any more than the Beatles did. They just recombined into new patterns. Kessler calls this bisociation, bringing one thing together with another. So, for example, if we take Kit Kat Chunky, Kit Kat Chunky is not out of the blue. It's a synthesis of the original four finger Kit Kat with what was called the Yorkie bar that the same company did, which was a kind of a, you know, a brick. Put those two together and you get a brick with a biscuit in the middle, Kit Kat Chunky. So that's a new pattern of existing components in the commercial world. So creativity is about the search for those new patterns. And some patterns are better than others, depending on, once again, subjective view of better. So for example, I can go to a piano. I can sit in front of a piano and go plinky, 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 but I'm not gonna actually get to Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. He gets there quicker than me, although in principle, I'm doing the same thing. So what you're searching for when you're combining and recombining these elements, which is the heart of the creative process, is to try to spot that pattern that has got an emergent property. Something suddenly happens which you think, oh, wow, that's really interesting. And once again, you're using your subjective judgment to do that. Um, and you're using your own values. You then talk about it with other people, which takes us into evaluation. Now, this is really important right now with AI because AI mechanizes that pattern formation process. 
And if you take music, for example, an AI algorithm can run through every combination of notes that you might think of vastly quicker than any human being. Now, it will then use historic patterns to filter out what they think is good and what they think is bad. So, for example, right now, someone is using ChatGPT or equivalent to write a song which will win next year's Eurovision Song Contest, where they're running through all those combinations almost at random, but using the patterns from previous Eurovision winners as the filter mechanism. That's their evaluation process. But that AI process must embody the biases of whoever wrote that algorithm of selection. And I think one of the great dangers of AI in in essence, adopting the creative process from the human being, is it will falter at that next step where it's using someone else's bias to distinguish a good pattern from a bad one. So human beings need to cover that and be wise. Well, all right. So creativity, as you're expressing it, or with Kessler's um, inputs, would would necessarily be that we're on standing on the shoulders of giants and such. It sounds like creativity for AI is just standing on the shoulders of normal human beings and the data that they have previously identified as appropriate patterns or not. This idea of bias, though, I, I'm, I tend to feel like it's, it's something of an ideal uh, and, and maybe even silly to wish to eliminate all forms of bias. Uh, I mean, the idea that I'm more biased towards my family over your families. Well, I think that's a totally fine bias. And Oh, but that's being exclusive. Well, yeah, we can't be inclusive of everything everywhere all the time. And when you are in a company in particular, you have to have strategic choices, which brings me to the last question um, about the book. Anyway, I want to have one more session with regard to your Mark story, but which is the, the notion of purpose or meaningfulness in the creative process. It's not something you... You de delve into it seems much as far as when I read it, but how, to what extent do you think that purpose and or meaningfulness can mold, uh, accelerate, boost creativity in an organization? Okay. Um, I think that it is quite possible to be creative just for exploration's sake without a particular purpose and just to see what might be out there. Now, um, I get into a lot of trouble with this because conventionally design thinking, for example, starts off with a problem statement. Now, as soon as you've got a problem statement, you have got a purpose statement as well because your purpose is to solve the problem. So I will go into um, a creativity workshop. We have got this problem to solve. We need to find a creative solution to it. And once we've done that, we have achieved that purpose. Now, um, I believe that creativity does not require a problem to solve. And the best workshops I've ever done where I've started saying, let us take this feature of the world and let's be creative about it. And then someone has said, but what's the problem statement? And I say, we haven't got one. And they say, well, why are we wasting our time if it already works? answer because we might discover something better if we were to look so i am of the camp that says we can take any feature of the world even one that seems to work well be creative and see if we can discover something better without an explicit purpose statement to start with because you might then discover something better and your purpose is then to implement something i'd never ever thought of if you wait until there is a problem to solve, for sure you need to fix it. You may or may not need to be creative. There may be familiar solutions. And that actually implies purpose. But actually, um, I think that a lot of people make a big mistake. We've all heard about disruptive innovation, where something comes from left field and knocks me out of business. Well, I say that's not about disruptive innovation from over there. It's about complacency here. I was complacent. I did not think or believe I had a problem. I was complacent. Therefore, I didn't look for something better. And guess what? When I've got the problem, it's too late. If, in fact, those organisations had been creative from a strong position, they might have discovered the disruption. 
So if you do have a purpose, I need a better legal system or I've got this problem to fix, sure, be creative. But I think creativity is enormously valuable just to explore, just in case there might be something out there. Yeah, it's like your model about observation and curiosity and then permission is, is a key process. Well, all right, so really, Dennis, grand stuff about creativity for scientists and engineers. Just want to finish the last bit because you uh, published this book at the end of 2022, and since then you've, you wrote another book. And it's another obviously hot topic uh, out there and very um, passionately held by you, which is all around the world of how we grade or mark papers. So you wrote a book um, that was called Missing the Mark, Why So Many School Exam Grades Are Wrong and How to Get Results We Can Trust. So this book um, gets you, uh, it seems, into lots of um, stormy topics uh, and you know, lots of challenging ideas because the government likes to say, well, we do it right. Tell us uh, what made you write this book and where do we stand on getting the mark right? Yeah, well, uh, thanks. Uh, this actually uh, emerged from some uh, work that I was doing. I was commissioned to do a consulting study by the exam regulator Ofcol uh, in England. They regulate uh, GCSE, ASA level examinations, vocational qualifications within England. So that got me interested um, about 10 years ago in the exam system. So I've been keeping an eye on that ever since. And um, in uh, 2018, Ofcol actually published some research. And what they did was they double marked huge numbers of scripts, 250,000 GCSE geography scripts. And they marked them by an ordinary examiner who's fully qualified. And they also marked them by a subject senior examiner. So every script had two marks and those marks are then mapped onto the grade scale. And they discovered something really very important to my mind. If we take geography, for example, 250,000 scripts, you might expect that 249,000 of those, the grade would be the same from both of those marks by the regular examiner and by the senior examiner. That was not what they discovered. For geography, they discovered that 65% of the grades were the same and that 35% of the grades were different. So when the scripts are marked, 65 are given what of course called the definitive senior examiner's grade, and 35 have a different grade, which is not the definitive grade, must be wrong. And they measured this for 14 subjects from maths through to history. And if you look at the overall average for exams, um, you have the startling result that only 75% of the grades issued are definitive, therefore right, and 25% of the grades are non-definitive or wrong. So just last month in August, in England, 6 million GCSE, AS and A-level grades were awarded. Which is just for high school, just for people who don't, aren't familiar yeah. with the British system. Yeah. GCSE age 16, AS, a few kids do it at 17, A-level, the big exam you need for university and college at age 18. 1.2 million candidates sat those exams at those three ages. A total of 6 million grades were awarded. Most kids do more than one subject. 1.5 million were wrong. Now, you may then say, well, that's fine. There's an appeal system. But actually, in 2016, Ofcol, the regulator, changed the appeal system so that you cannot get those wrong grades corrected. They are wrong forever. Just and, so, Dennis, just so for clarity's sake, how do we know 1.5 million of those grades were wrong? Yeah, um, it comes from the original research published in 2018. The weighted average across subjects is 75% are definitive, 25% are not. That's one in four. I see. So yeah. you're, you're using the statistics of that study and applying it to the results of 2023. Yeah, yeah. Okay. This is the only study of that nature. And it covers 14 of the um, exam subjects, maths, physics, biology, chemistry, history, geography, sociology. So it's a good mix of subjects. Not all the subjects. There's no modern foreign languages in there, no French. Um, art and music aren't in there, but the mainstream subjects are there. 
Um, now, um, I feel that that is doing a grave social injustice. So I exercised a bit of creativity to discover ways in which you could deliver grades that were fully reliable. And in order to try to um, get some people to see what was going on, um, I wrote the book uh, called Missing the Mark, which is giving all the evidence that I've just encapsulated. It gives solutions, but it also talks about in some detail what actually happened during the COVID crisis in 2020 and 2021, when schools were for the most part closed, kids were working at home, formal exams were scrapped. And especially in 2020, there was huge chaos in England when the government tried to use a machine learning type algorithm to assign grades and that all blew up and that was a total chaos. So thanks for asking about that, Minta. It's all about why, um, you know, 1.5 million grades were wrong last August. Just one other thing, if, if I may, 1.5 million grades wrong is actually bigger than 1.2 million candidates. So that means on average, every young person in the country had at least one wrong grade without the right of appeal, every kid. And just, um, I'm assuming then that, for example, a subject like maths would have less errors because you know, two plus two, generally speaking, equals four, unless you want to be a philosophical major. And then others where the interpretations are much more subjective and require much more sort of writing and maybe even creativity, as in an English, um, would have more. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely right. Um, I mentioned the 14 subjects. Maths was at the top of the list, and only four in every 100 are wrong in the sense I've described. Geography is 65-35. History is about half and half. Oh, my gosh. So if you're doing GCSE or A-level history, you've pretty well got a 50% chance of getting the wrong grade. And, of course, that correlates with exactly your intuition about you know the uncertainty let's say associated with 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 marking an essay well you've just opened up a whole hornet's nest for me dennis we're gonna to have to spend a couple of minutes on this one history 50 50 what is it i mean the thing that drives me bonkers i've written a biography of the second world war and and recognize that it's very hard to be entirely accurate uh, at historical um fact checking and all this because some things are, are out there for for interpretation. However, it seems to me that uh, as a country, United States included, by the way, the, the, the way we evaluate or we, we discuss history is completely bonkers. We've gone from studying history in its context to criticizing whatever's happened in the past according to today's context, which is not history. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, 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 I'm with you 100%. Although the issue of the, you know, the wrong history grades is actually much more prosaic it means that if i've written an essay for you know the origins of the first world war that i might do in uh, gcse or something about the french revolution at a level different examiners marking exactly that essay will give rather different marks but it turns out that you know at the end of the day those different marks mean that there's a 50 50 chance that another examiner would have given me you know, a different grade, which might have been higher, it might have been lower. So any young person who maybe failed to get a university or college place because they got a B rather than an A in history, it's 50-50. In fact, uh, as a result of the pressure that I've been kicking up about, this has actually been a subject which both the Commons Education Select Committee and the Lords Select Committee have asked questions about. And as a result of the questioning, one of Ofqual's chief regulators, a lady called Dame Glenis Stacey, who was chief regulator 2012 to 2016, she commissioned my original work in 2013, in fact, and also was chief regulator for a short period in 2020 after the algorithm. She was asked about this, and she is on record as saying, grades are reliable to one grade either way. Now, that's a bit different from one graded four is wrong. They're actually the same statement. But 
Ofcom officially have acknowledged that grades are reliable to one grade either way, which means if you get a certificate which says history grade B, what that's really saying is maybe a B, maybe a C, maybe an A, no one knows. That's well, the funny I'm thing saying. is I got a B in history myself back in 1982. You really A-level. never an A there, Minter, I can tell <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. No, but uh, <laughs> I also think that the way history was taught compared to the way history is taught, for those who even care to, because we're down to 2% of people at, at higher levels of education studying history, as opposed to 6% back in my day, where we, we don't really care about studying history in its context back then. We just want to do a sociological critique. And I have to imagine that that has also uh, uh, contaminated our ability to have a, a more objective version of the historical facts. Could well be. Um, to be honest, I haven't actually studied any history since I was you know, 15 or 16 and did GCSE. So how that was 100 years ago. Um, how history is actually taught these days will be much uh, better informed than I. But uh, I can well understand from the bits and pieces uh, I hear and from some of, the, some of the kind of pressures that you read about that, um, you know, the teaching of history is... Um, has a, a lot more um, potential baggage, let's say, around it than, than, than teaching physics or biology, you know, because it's about society, it's about politics, it's about the way we live, and it's about values that you can explore or indeed exclude. I think it's a very, very important subject. Amen to that, Dennis. Um, beautiful. What a wonderful, sparkling and stirring conversation oh, we've had, Dennis. Uh, so how can people follow your work, get your books? So what's the, what, where, where should they be going for this immediately? Yeah, well, um, anyone interested in, in my books, uh, actually I've written 15 books, we've talked about two of them, um, but uh, you know, at the moment, pretty well all of them are on uh, Amazon, that's probably the uh, most accessible place to go. Um, but creativity for scientists and engineers, you know, is, if you are of that heritage or you like a disciplined approach to things, it's one to go for. And if you're a teacher or if you're a parent or indeed if you're a student and you want to know more about what's happening with those GCSE, AS and A-level grades, you know, missing the mark is going to you know, blow your pants off, to be honest. On those kicker words, um, Dennis, many, many thanks. Thank you too, Minter. My pleasure. My pleasure and indeed honour.